in welcoming David Pello. David Pello. So. Oh, are we getting feedback here? Do you hear feedback-y? No. Are you good? Okay. It might have been that speaker over there. Um, so, David, welcome to English 24. And David, really, I thought there were three reasons why we wanted you to come. Okay. One, we've um, not directly broached the question of environmental justice, climate justice in the class. We've had people talking about it in some very particular ways. So we had um, Nicole Seymour here last Wednesday talking about LBGTQ plus um, issues regarding justice. But that's one job to talk about that. No, wait, did I hear feedback there? Is this, maybe we should move back a little. <laughs> I don't wanna move back too far because we'll get into the light. Okay, how about that? Is that a little better? Uh, uh, Kevin, can you make the feedback go away? Uh, do, are you hearing feedback? Is it, are these speakers live here or something? Is that the problem? Or maybe we're getting feedback because of my lapel mic and David's got the handheld. So we'll see. Um, okay, second thing, we'd like to hear about your research. Uh, but also, uh, for people who don't know, David is a professor here in the Environmental Studies Department. And until recently, for four years, you were chair of the department. So if we have questions about the ES department, how it works, the major and all that, we can put them to David as well. So for everyone, we're in week eight. Lecture number 14, the Q&A is open on Canvas. I will be looking at that once I ask David some initial questions. And David, just so you know, in the middle of asking you questions, if I start looking at my phone, it's nothing personal, I'm not bored. Um, so I guess the question is, first off, I'm asking everyone the same one. How did you get interested in all this? Hold on. Uh, it'll work, it'll work, it's bound to work. Okay. There you go. All right. All right. Thanks so much, Professor Hiltner, for, for inviting me to English 24. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Uh, so let me, let me give a partial answer to that question by talking about this picture. This photo you see is from the early 1960s, probably about 1962. And the, the person there, in the lower right, uh, short African-American woman. Her name is Mary Lee Pless, and- This is her? This is her. And she was one of the very first students to, uh, to matriculate to Vanderbilt University Peabody College in Nashville, Tennessee in the early 1960s. She ended up being the first black woman to get her PhD from, from that institution. And, you know, in order to survive, she, she made friends, and uh, most of her friends, by definition, had to be white. In the South, in the early 1960s, um, segregation was, was still all the rage. We literally were, and legally, in, a, in an apartheid system in the United States. That's surprising for many people to hear, but it's true. Um, and this picture you see is, is a scene that occurred right after she and her white friends had gone into this establishment, the Campus Grill, local restaurant, and her white friends were served, but she wasn't. The person behind the counter says, oh, I'm so sorry, we don't serve N-words. And Mary, Mary Pless, being always uh, full of joy and cheeky, uh, cheekiness and, and humor, she smiled and said, oh, you don't serve N-words? Great, I don't want one, I want a hamburger. That would be great. <laughs> um, they weren't amused. She was summarily kicked out of the place. And her white friends joined her and said, let's start a protest, a sit-in, and they built up part of this, the movement that was part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was the youth-led arm of the civil rights movement. And in a very short time, uh, they had a citywide protest out in front of this, this restaurant. The mayor of Nashville showed up and said, you do realize you're all putting your lives at risk. There's crazy racists out here who want you dead. There's like 300 of them lined up on the street right now. Is this really worth it? And Mary Pless says it's worth it. Our lives are worth it. The future of this country is worth it. This is what we're doing uh, because we must. And so the mayor 
did a, a 180, walked away and signed a resolution desegregating all of the restaurants in the city of Nashville. So this is a major victory for civil rights and human rights. Mary Lee Pless, a couple years later, met this guy with a sexy British accent. Um, he wasn't faking, he was actually from England. They, uh, they got together, continued to protest. They got married and a few years after that, they gave birth to me, yours truly. Um, and so I have always been inspired by her example and the fire that she lit in my belly as a thirst and a hunger for justice. And that's what led me to my work. So I've always been in, involved in and interested in um, and deeply embracing and supportive of environmental sustainability, climate health, etc. Uh, but it wasn't until I really started to think about the lessons my mother and, and father taught me about how to integrate that with, with a focus on equity and fairness and justice. So, so that's, that's how I got involved. <laughs> this is such a terrific story. And it's amazing you have that image. Um, okay, so that's the, the justice component. Environmental, how did you get interested in that? So yeah, the, the environment, I would say my, uh, my dad was really primarily responsible for that. He, um, almost every weekend, we would go out swimming in a lake, going, in, going backpacking, hiking, cooking marshmallows, hot dogs in the backwoods of Tennessee, um, the, the Appalachian region there, some Great Smoky Mountains. So he, uh, he was responsible for that. But there was a, an incident one time when we were on a Saturday morning going to Percy Priest Lake, which was my favorite swimming hole. And I, as we were about to get out of the car, I, for whatever reason, I opened up the glove box, the glove compartment, and there was a shiny steel object in the glove compartment. And I knew that wasn't a toy, that was a gun. And I said, Dad, what in the hell is going on? I thought we were a family who didn't believe in this. He goes, yeah, I did too. But did you hear the story about the riot that had occurred at another swimming hole and where white folks were attacking black people who were committing the crime of wanting to recreate on a Saturday on a weekend. Uh, this was happening in Chicano, Latinx communities and black communities all over the country. And he gave me sort of a short lesson, a history lesson, in how folks of various backgrounds, in some cases even, even Jews, Catholics, certainly indigenous folks, people of color, um, immigrants, queer folks, have been made to feel unsafe in, in many environments, just trying to have, actually have a, have a good time, go recreate. And I appreciated the history lesson, but all I wanted to do was swim. So he kind of ruined it for me that day, but, but that was a lesson that stayed with me um, since my early childhood. And so yeah, so I made it my mission to, to study that, to teach about that, and to promote um, access to, to green space, to open space, to recreational space as a small but important part of the struggle for environmental and climate justice. Yeah, that's great, that's great. And a great segue into my next question, which is, um, again, we haven't had it directly. So what is environmental justice? And if you wanna talk about climate justice in there or just environmental justice as a start, and, and why does it matter? Yeah, so if you look on the United States Environmental Protection Agency website, they will define environmental justice as more or less the equal and fair development and implementation of environmental laws, environmental policies, protocols, et cetera. And that, that's a good start. Uh, but I'll, let me tell you a quick story to show you why that is inadequate. So when I was working and living in Chicago, there's a great environmental justice attorney, Keith Harling. He's still alive and kicking to this day. He tore apart that definition because he said the definition of environmental justice from the EPA's perspective is all focused on environment and all focused on the law. Because again, that's a good start, but it's not adequate. Because David, here on the southeast side of Chicago, we literally have hundreds of companies and various facilities and operations and development projects that are polluting the environment. And every one of them could be completely within operating within the law. So following the law, no laws are being broken, and yet it would still be an environmental and public health catastrophe and an injustice because everybody on the southeast side of Chicago, whether you're white, black, brown, or somewhere in the middle, working class folks. So already that's an environmental injustice, and these folks are being, being poisoned. Um, but it's also the case, again, that this is perfectly within the legal limits. So his point is, is it was a political decision. It was a series of economic decisions that led to this extraordinarily high density of polluting, poisoning operations in this one small community. 
and applying environmental laws equally and evenly is not going to solve that problem. So that brings me to another definition of environmental justice, which goes beyond just sort of equally applying the law, which says, and this, this comes from hundreds of, of conversations I've had with activists around the world, and it's really a vision and a practice in which no community is unfairly or disproportionately burdened with environmental harm, with climate harm, etc., but also where ecological sustainability prevails and where democracy is practiced, where people are able to exercise agency, influence, uh, power and control over their lives, over their fates, and over the fates and lives of their neighbor, of their neighbors, hopefully in collaboration. Um, and so that's why it matters. Environmental justice and climate justice really matter, uh, not because we're so much focused on these quote-unquote special interest groups, minoritized populations, indigenous peoples, immigrants, women, queer folks, etc. It matters because everybody is actually ultimately impacted. And so many Native American and other indigenous scholars and activists will, will point out that it's indigenous peoples who are the stewards of some of the most biodiverse, rich regions on planet Earth. So if you don't give a damn about indigenous peoples, and a lot of us don't, um, sadly, if you don't give a damn about that, but you care about the climate, then you need to pay attention to what's going on with indigenous folks and their territories, their waters, their communities, and support indigenous sovereignty, because that is a surefire way to protect the climate and the environment for all of us. So those are just some reasons why it matters. Uh, yeah, <laughs> great, great reasons, great definitions. And Damien, you mentioned something I'll just throw in here, um, because it's really the first taste I think that we had in this class, if I'm remembering how I structured it. Uh, everyone watched the documentary Survival, Cook Survival by Zip Code, which is based on the book, which is about 1996 in Chicago, you were there, right? You just mentioned you were in Chicago at one point. Um, what's up, what happened there and how was that a justice issue? Yeah, so in, in the 90s, I mean, I could talk about a lot of things in Chicago. Of course, there, there, was, there was the heat wave. Uh, 1995 killed more than 700 people. And Eric Kleinenberg has a great book called Heat Wave, I think, uh, on that particular issue. He's a great uh, professor of social sciences at uh, NYU. And, you know, if you were elderly, if you were low income or low wealth, if you were a person of color, if you're living in certain zip codes, if you didn't have support networks, if you didn't have somebody who you could call uh, to help you out with your, your medication, some food, whatever, uh, you were extremely vulnerable and to, to death. And, and 700 people died during that heat wave. I don't know that a lot of people connected that to climate change at the time. A number of scientists were, of course, doing so. Uh, but politicians, left, right, and center, weren't paying as much attention to that at the time. But that was, that was a big event in the 90s um, in, in Chicago. But a lot of other great things were happening in, in the city of Chicago uh, at that time. This was a place where I was honored to be a, a part of the, the Midwest Great Lakes Environmental Justice Network. This was a, a group of folks from Detroit, from Chicago, from all over the Midwest, even Western Pennsylvania, Western New York, who came together uh, to devise a vision, a plan, a framework for how we could move our region, our bioregion, of uh, these, these great metropolises and the, the Great Lakes um, ecosystems as well toward greater sustainability, toward greater justice, toward greater, uh, greater equity. So a lot of great things going on in Chicago at that time. But yes, uh, at that time, it is true that that city, and I don't know where we are today, but that city was the single most racially segregated city in the United States. And me being a Southerner at the time, I'm from the South, I was like, wait, really? Wow, that would blow my mom away. She's like, Chicago, that's the North. Are you kidding me? Uh, yeah, and, and I know this because Wilmot James, who's a professor from South Africa, he actually came, did a talk at Northwestern University when I was there in the 1990s, showing spatially, geographically, how the apartheid system in South Africa had divided people by various groups, um, and how the city of Chicago was actually just as bad, if not worse. Uh, that, that was a mind blower. And here we are in 2024, still dealing with, with apartheid in this country and other, other parts of the world. Uh, but I am pleased to say that people are at least recognizing that and mobilizing 
uh, for, for a better world. So I don't know that I offered a partial answer to the question. But. No, you answered it. It's a great answer. Okay. Um, and actually, what you just said, David, got me thinking, maybe just to clarify to folks, you're, of course, a professor here at UCSB. Your focus is on environmental justice. So the class knows are very fortunate. David's too uh, modest to note. He's probably the leading environmental justice scholar in the United States. Um, Bob Bowers not here, so we don't have to put him to. <laughs> but absolutely. But David, you think of yourself not just, or do you think of yourself just as a scholar, or are you a scholar activist, and what, in fact, is that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think of myself as a scholar act, activist, activist scholar. People use those, those terms interchangeably. And I guess for me, what that, that means is just a recognition that the production of knowledge, teaching of knowledge, sharing of knowledge, even receiving knowledge, consuming knowledge, uh, is, is never a politically neutral act. And by politically, um, I, I mean an act that has consequences for, for the distribution and of power, right? So it's not just about whatever, whether I'm politically independent, Democrat, Republican, Tory, Whig, whatever. Um, <laughs> it, it's about understanding that knowledge can, and not, you know, people always say knowledge is power. Uh, not necessarily, but knowledge can reflect um, and, and be an opportunity to, to exercise power. And the relationship between knowledge, power, and democracy, in my, my view, is very important. Um, yeah, my, my mother, my father, my stepmom, all educators, and all understood very clearly that those principles, those truths, those practices. Um, and that for me, it's not just about, oh, well, let me make sure that what I think about the world I share and drill into people's heads and indoctrinate them. No, it's understanding that the knowledge I have today is always partial and that I always have to be listening and rec receiving of new ideas so that we can work together collectively to try to improve our lives. So, so I do that all the time uh, in my classes, on campus, off campus. So I, I had a class a few years ago, an undergraduate class and a grad class that were collaborating. Every student in the class worked with uh, a nonprofit organization in the region and through this, this group called the Central Coast of California Climate Justice Network. And I did this speed dating thing where these activists from these organizations would come in and say, hey, we're looking to hire people, but we need to test your mettle. We need to understand, can students at UCSB produce knowledge that is useful for actually improving the climate? in the Central Coast, in this region. We have several campaigns we're working on, and we would love your help. So students met with and interviewed uh, with these organizations through my class, and we decided to focus on two campaigns. And so this was activist scholarship, scholar activism at work. Uh, the students forced me to reduce the amount of readings by like half, because they're like, dude, you, you want us to be out in the community doing all this crap? Like, yo, and it's important crap, but it's a lot of stuff you better reduce the amount of readings in this class or we're gonna not show up. We can't do both. So 50% on the readings, and so the students up their game on this activism, they were working on two campaigns. One was the Cat Canyon oil campaign. Cat Canyon is north of Santa Barbara County, beautiful, biodiverse, rich region, where three oil companies were proposing to drill nearly 800 oil wells. This would have impacted the water systems of 12 cities in our region. Some 200,000 people's water systems may have been affected by this, let alone flora and fauna, let alone climate. It would have tripled the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in Santa Barbara County if we had let these three oil companies in there to do their dirty deeds. Um, students did the research on the environmental impact reports that the companies and the government had produced, and the students discovered that in terms of water usage, it was totally low-balled. Students discovered that in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions that were predicted to come out of these operations, completely underestimated. And so the students produced their own empirically informed, scientifically informed estimates of this, and it was way off the charts. And we were like, yo, we have got a serious climate catastrophe here. We've got to mobilize. So students were writing op-eds in the newspapers, online, on social media, testifying at county board of supervisor hearings, mobilizing people to come out. And a few years ago, we successfully got all three oil companies to pull out. It was a total victory for environmental justice, climate justice. And to me, that was an example of how knowledge can be used in the service of power. Um, and to build democracy, and, and, and students and community members came together for that end. And we did the same thing to extend a moratorium on oil and gas drilling 
in Ventura County after the U.S. Geological Survey had discovered that there was oil in our water systems that was feeding into our agricultural systems, our, our, our crops. And students decided we've got to do something about that. They mobilized people to show up at County Board of Supervisor hearings in Ventura. They did their research. They wrote op-eds. They went to the bodegas. They went to mercados. They went to Whole Foods with bilingual, multilingual um, advertisements. And people showed up and testified, no, we don't want to drink oil. We don't want to eat oil. We want to eat food. We want to drink clean water. So get that stuff out of our, out of our crops, out of our food systems. We succeeded. We got that moratorium uh, extended in another victory for climate and environmental justice. All of that was successful in part, not entirely because of, but in part because we understood the value of scholarly work, the value of students doing research, the value of writing papers, of getting on social media, projecting and sharing that, that work, and mobilizing people. So students, I think, felt very empowered and powerful when they saw how using basic academic skills can, can really make real social change and improve uh, people's lives and the health of the planet. So I'm very proud to have learned from my students from that example. Yeah, those are great examples. And actually, it gets me thinking, I'll give you another one you can talk to. Um, the EcoVista project, which is the notion that we could turn Isla Vista into an eco-village, began in one of your classes also. Yes, I can take no credit for that. It was 100%. Uh, students who just, you know, based on my invitation to, hey, do a, do a really cool creative final project in this class. And yeah, three or four students came together, uh, Jessica Parfrey, Valentia Cambrera, a few other folks. And yeah, they started this thing. Hey, we live in Isla Vista. Let's make Isla Vista a more sustainable, a more equitable community. And so Eco Vista was born. And I think one of the spin-off projects is the IV, IV Food Forest, or that's certainly that's related right. Right. to that. And uh, the, this idea that, yeah, we are going to produce food sustainably, you know, equitably, uh, healthy food, healthy, nutritious food, vegan food, plant-based diets. Um, in this land, in this space that we have, we understand we will honor the fact that we are on Chumash land. We will learn from that, that, that history and from Chumash leaders in the present who are in our community and uh, produce, produce food for folks who need it. Um, this is just one of many amazing things that folks are doing. I'll give a shout out to another group of students who, some of whom were in one of my classes, I can't take credit for this one either, but IVTP, the Isla Vista Trading Post, um, which is now a truly, truly successful operation, bricks and mortar operation, sometimes a pop-up where people are providing clothing for, for folks in our community who need it um, for free and um, you know, creating all sorts of value in reusing and sharing and repurposing uh, things that we all need, right? Clothing for, for, our, for our family members, our community members. So I have to say, this is just one of the, there's a couple of the, the most exciting examples of the kind of leadership that UCSB students have taken on that continuously inspire me. I never had ideas like this when I was a student. It was just a drone. Let me just take this freaking class and get through this thing. Um, and, you know, and I, also I couldn't even have gotten into UCSB with the kinds of grades that I had, believe me. So uh, it's wonderful that now I'm a professor and I'm learning from the people who did get in. But yeah, uh, Ivy Trading Post, EcoVista, really, really excellent, excellent initiatives that, that if you aren't involved in that, learn more, support them, please. Uh, yeah, and you can just put in your browser EcoVista and you will get there. And actually the food forest, uh, Summer Gray and I are co-teaching a course and two weeks ago we had the class at the food forest, which is great. If you haven't gone there, you should absolutely go there. Um, David, I'm going to ask you a little bit about your own personal research and your own sort of you know, you know, intervention here. And while you're doing that, just so the class knows, I'm going to turn on the eye clicker one more time. So. So a, a word about my research, or are you going to say more about that? Or <laughs> No, <laughs> I was hoping you would. <laughs> okay, yeah, let me hit that. Uh, yeah, so, so the research I do is, is focused on environmental justice, climate justice, and again, um, I think of that as the, the multiple intersections between trying to make sure that our, our ecosystems, our habitats, our biosphere, our planet is healthy, is lush, is verdant, is, is green, is robust, and making sure that we have robust and, and healthy human communities, when, you know, through de democratic engagement, consensus-based decision-making, through nonviolent, peaceful social change efforts. 
And uh, so my research, going back many years, I started in Chicago, uh, where my dissertation and later a book called Garbage Wars was focused on how communities across the ethnic and racial spectrum in Chicago were fighting against waste incinerators, garbage dumps, hazardous waste incinerators, et cetera, and wanted to make their communities cleaner, safer, more sustainable, more equitable. And I chart chronicled that struggle from the 1880s when European immigrants were dealing with that, when Jewish folks and Eastern European immigrants were being dumped on in the city of Chicago all the way up to the year uh, 2000 where um, an even broader uh, ethnic and racial spectrum of folks were, were fighting for environmental justice and really were coming together and realizing that they couldn't just work to keep trash and waste and, and hazardous chemical incinerators out of their neighborhoods because it was always gonna go to somebody else's neighborhood that they needed to build a multiracial alliance um, to keep it out of Chicago and to reduce that waste at the source. So, so that was uh, one of the first projects that I was involved in. Then I did some work later on on looking at the, the high-tech industry, the electronics industry or the, the IT industry, which I, I would say even to this day, but certainly over the decades, many folks in industry and certainly government and the media have really painted that, that industry as clean, as safe, environmentally pure. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. It's truly uh, maybe second only to the nuclear industry in terms of the amount of toxins that, and the danger and the risk that we see being produced out of the IT industry. So, um, so I wrote a couple of books with some colleagues on that and the struggle from folks from Asia, Latin America, Europe, the United States, and Canada to try to make uh, that, that industry, the electronics industry, more sustainable, more receptive, more responsive. And rather than saying, hey, let's shut this thing down and abolish it. No, not a good idea. Let's make it more equitable. Let's make it more sustainable. And I think we've done a fairly good job of that. Back 22 years ago, we started an organization, a network called the International Campaign for Responsible Technology. This is now a global movement that seeks to use research to mobilize, to get these companies to be more uh, sustainable, to clean up their act. And we've gotten uh, HP, Compaq, IBM, Dell, across the board, all of these companies to reduce their toxic um, pollution, to reduce the toxic inputs, to recycle their products at the end of life, and to do so without using prison labor. And why do I bring that up? Well, because Dell Computer Corporation first signed on to our agreement, the Pledge of True Recycling Stewardship, Electronic Stewardship, and we're like, Michael Dell just signed on? That's amazing. Kind of like one of those Hollywood movies where like 10 minutes in, the good guys win the battle. It's like, yeah, that was easy. Pregnant pause, and somebody goes, a little too easy. We still got an hour and a half in this flick. Something bad's gonna happen. And yeah, it did. Michael Dell had people who were, you know, enslaved, right? Juridically, legally, constitutionally enslaved, AKA prisoners, incarcerated folks recycling his computers, our computers. I had a Dell at the time. I'm like, no, man, we're not doing this. So we had a campaign that was focused on him. We personalized it and uh, we called him the toxic dude, and he responded after many, many months of pressure. It's like, wow, one of the most powerful CEOs in the country, he signed a pledge of no more e-waste recycling, computer recycling, uh, using uh, prison labor. We got all these other con companies and countries, the entire U European Union and the entire University of California system, biggest university system on earth, to also sign this pledge. Um, and so we wrote up about that in a book called Challenging the Chip, uh, Labor Rights and Environmental Justice in the High-Tech Industry, something like that. The chip meaning the microchip. Anyway, more recently, I've been doing research at the intersection of carceral systems and environmental justice. So building on some of that work on the electronics industry, one of the things that we found was that at Water Prison in the state of California, this was one of the places where incarcerated people were doing e-waste recycling, and it was incredibly hazardous work. And so I began to ask the question, are there other places where we can find the intersection of prisons or jails or immigrant prisons and environmental issues? And yes, it's quite difficult, in fact, to find a prison on planet Earth where the water is clean. Um, the water is often contaminated, visibly so. Many prisons and jails and immigrant detention centers are located smack dab on or next to hazardous waste sites or in flood zones, et cetera. And many of these prisons, as in the case of electronics waste recycling, are places where hazardous waste itself is being generated. A study in 2020 just found out 
I guess that's four years ago, um, that prisons in the United States, mass incarceration, actually produces an enormous amount of greenhouse gases just through the everyday building and operation and the maintenance of prisons. So again, this is an example like the indigenous sovereignty example I was mentioning earlier. If you don't give a damn about prisoners and you just think, oh, they've all committed crimes, they're all guilty, lock them up and throw away the key, okay. Do you care about the climate? If you do, we need to focus on prison abolition. So this is yet another example of how single issue scholarship or single issue politics is always narrow, overly narrow and limiting. Think about the intersections, how we connect the dots between one struggle, one issue, and another, uh, and you will almost always find a more productive and creative and impactful way of thinking about the world and thinking about how to change the world. So those are some examples of some of the research I've been doing. That's all. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the next, the big, the question, the final one I um, talked about is that you're representative of ES, that's your uh, department, and you were chair there. And um, if you could tell us a little bit about it, but I, I told you the story before you were there. Um, when a colleague of ours introduced you as the chair of the ES Environmental Science Program. So I think a lot of people think ES is science or mostly science. I mean, you can get a BS there. You can also get a BA there. So what's our ES program? And, and for people who don't know, we have one of the largest, oldest, and most respected ES departments in the country. There you go, yes, Environmental Studies Program. I'm proud to be a faculty member there. Yeah, we've been around since 1970. We were one of four organizations, if you will, that were founded in the, in the wake of the 1969, what is often called the Santa Barbara oil spill, although many of us are, have rebranded that as the Unical oil blowout, because Unical was, Ken, are you, are you texting? I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, the Unical oil blowout, because the Unical it was the name of the company, uh, Union Oil of California was the name of that company, uh, they're responsible for that, that oil spill, that oil blowout. Santa Barbara wasn't. Anyway, Three other organizations were the Environmental Defense Center, which is still around today, does incredible work. The Community Environmental Council, an amazing organization, still around today. Uh, and Get Oil Out, affectionately known by its acronym GOO, G -O -O. Anyway, the Environmental Studies Program was founded because students and faculty and staff were saying, this major global environmental event just happened here in our little town, our coastal California town, and I don't know that we have the tools to address this. We need a new department, a new program, a new discipline to do this. So um, environmental sciences is, is one third of that. Environmental humanities is one third of that. The environmental social sciences is the last third of that. And it's the one major on campus, I think, where you have to actually take classes in the sciences, in the humanities, in the arts, and the social sciences to get through. So we pride ourselves on that. Uh, we also are a, a department that, that has, I'd like to say, three additional fo focuses or foci. One is we are solutions oriented. So yeah, there's a lot of talk about, oh, the climate catastrophe is horrible. What are we gonna do about that? We're doing stuff about that. That's all I've been talking about today, solutions. Another, uh, the second leg of course is, as I've just mentioned, is interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity, right? No single discipline is gonna solve this problem. Uh, every discipline has something to, to offer us. And the third is a focus on equity. So those three, those three pillars, equity and justice, interdisciplinarity, and solutions focus. We have a lot of fun. We throw the best parties. We have the coolest staff and students and faculty, because basically our students are also double majoring in all sorts of other places. So they're in English, they're in econ, they're in the sciences, every, every, everything in between. So it's a great place to hang out. And um, yeah, I'm not going anywhere, so feel free to come by my office and, and chat. And, and David has a great office with a great view. So. Um, but you're talking about students, so it's a very diverse group of students in ES. Um, so could you just address that a little? Because I think we might have the idea that it's sort of, you know, again, science focused, certain group of students, but not the case. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is new to me. I, I must say, um, maybe it's a California thing, maybe it's a Santa Barbara thing, but yeah, our environmental studies program is incredibly diverse demographically. I mean, I've already mentioned Subject-wise, we are you know, super interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, but, but yeah, our faculty are more than, a uh, majority of our faculty identify as female, as women. A uh, quarter of our faculty identify as people of color. Uh, our 
more than half of our majors identify as women, as, as female. And I think we're about half uh, at, the, at the people of color mark. So, so our major is looking more, and our department is looking more like planet Earth, looking more like, like America. And we are just, I think, just a really welcoming space. So, and a space of learning. Like, you know, people will say things like, oh, you know, this group or that country caused the climate crisis. Like, mm, I think it's far more complicated than that. We all play a role in contributing to this problem, which is an awesome responsibility and an awesome recognition that we all have a legitimate role in solving this problem. So again, back to inclusivity, back to democracy. Um, environmental studies is, is a great, great space for that. So yeah, um, definitely, definitely one of the most diverse uh, in, environments I've been in. And um, amazingly, one of those positive environments I've been in, I gotta tell you, I, there are times when, you know, the stuff will hit the fan, I'll hear something in the news, oh, there was another oil spill or something, I come into my class and my head's hanging low, and the students are like, chin up, pillow, we got work to do. I'm like, oh, okay. So I get inspired by the students. Somehow we can never get y'all down, so I don't know. Um, I'm learning from the students every day, feeling, feeling motivated. So yeah, a really good positive space, like the rest of the campus. Yeah. Let's just say that. Right. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to go to questions now, which is why I have my phone out. So folks, if you want to put questions in, uh, week number eight, Q&A for lecture number 14. We have some already, and they're follow-ups on what you were uh, talking about, David. So first one, can you talk more about these IT electronics companies and how they're contributing to environmental pollution and also maybe exploiting labor? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really important question, a big question, because of course, IT companies are, even if it's a local company, it's part of a global network. So anything that affects one community, one company, of course, affects all. Uh, specifically, of course, we have, you know, I, I would say in your average desktop computer and in many, many cell phones, we have a whole range of, of chemicals that we've been, been tracking, uh, things like mercury, beryllium, you know, cadmium, lead, all sorts of things like that that have been polluting our environment for, for decades. Let me say that in Silicon Valley several years ago, the US EPA did a study of a toxic plume underneath, uh, underneath the ground, underneath, underneath the surface, um, just a huge 11 mile plume of, of toxic waste that was caused by, by spills by various electronics companies. And the US EPA, and this was maybe in the early 2000s, had said that even if we were working 24 hours a day, night and day, it would take like 300 years to clean this thing up. The United States of America isn't even 300 years old. So just put that into, into that sort of temporal context. Um, and that this is in the first world, in the richest country on earth this is happening. You know, if this is going on in a, in a third world, global south country, you know, you could say, oh, well, they don't have regulations. That's just what happens over there. That's what's happening here. And so uh, industry, the government are not gonna save us. So we had groups like the Santa Clara Center for Occupational Safety and Health, the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition, and our partners in Asia, Latin America, Canada, Europe, West Africa, working together to share information about these companies and to, to make sure they're, they're more sustainable and more responsive. So, so that's just one example, but I could talk about RCA in Taiwan. Um, I could talk about all sorts of companies, you know, from Scotland down to, to Argentina that have really made a mess of our environments. But the flip side again is that workers in these, in these companies recognize those problems and have been mobilizing. And we see this in places like Google as well. Uh, so I'm really, really pleased to say that some of the strongest environmentalists are people who are working in some of the companies that are causing the greatest problems. And that gives me hope because those folks understand the problem and they have the solutions. Okay, let me jump to another one. Just a great answer, by the way. Um, question is, I have no doubt in my mind that the great injustices that prisons um, commit today, but as you mentioned, pr uh, prison abolition, what would be the most viable alternative to prison facilities? Additionally, what is your stance on the difficulties faced by incarcerated, incarcerated individuals when voting? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I'll say this. I think there, there's a debate within the, the abolition community, the community that is critical of, of incarceration, and more or less, it kind of goes like this. You got people on one side who are like, absolutely no prisons anywhere, ever again. 
And then you have some folks like Michelle Alexander, who's the author of the, the best-selling book, The New Jim Crow, uh, which if you haven't checked that out, please do. It's really, really important work. And she says, you know what? I'm not so sure that getting rid of all forms of incarceration is a good idea for what many people would say would be the obvious reasons, because there are some folks out there who are just extremely dangerous and are going to continue to harm people. And we do need to come up with ways for addressing that. And the hardcore abolitionist community has not done a very good job of that. Michelle Alexander will say, what I want to abolish isn't necessarily all prisons, all jails, immigrant detention centers, all forms of incarceration. What I want to abolish is mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is the real problem for Michelle Alexander. It's just sort of dragnetting all of these people in these communities, outlawing perfectly harmless kinds of activities. And we've had a healthy debate around cannabis um, on that particular issue. And let's focus on decarceration. Let's focus on not creating unnecessary laws that aren't actually making people safer, not making society uh, healthier, et cetera, and people who have committed those quote unquote crimes, getting them out of prison, not putting more people into prison who are committing nonviolent acts of desperation, um, crimes of survival, et cetera. And let's talk about healing programs focused on restorative justice, restitution. We've got one on this campus, by the way, in the SRB building that has just launched. You can learn about that. So there are all sorts of act alternatives. There are really good alternatives that we see in places like Norway, in places like Honduras and other countries where people are incarcerated at night and during the day are allowed to go work off campus, off the facility, making a living, bringing home a paycheck for them, their families, and then they spend the night in the lockup. They are treated like human beings. They have mental health workers. They have counselors. They are given adequate medical care. They are given training so that when they're done serving their time, they are not so mentally damaged that they're going to continue to offend when they get out of prison, and they have a job waiting for them, right? Or they have skills that they've developed. So we see programs, small programs like this in the United States. That is a far better uh, approach <laughs> to dealing with crime than, than mass incarceration. But the other thing I want to point out is that it is extraordinarily rare when you see a, a head of state, a government official, or a CEO of a corporation spending even an hour in a, an incarceral facility. The facilities, the carceral systems in every country on earth were not set up to deal with that. They were set up to incarcerate low wealth people, people who are already on the margins. People are committing what we call index crimes, right? Assault and battery, theft, etc. Why am I talking about that? Because without a doubt, and it's not even a debate, if you want a debate, it'll be a mic drop on your ass because there is literally no comparison between the, whole, the social, the economic, and the environmental harm that everyday crime perpetrates and results in versus the real harm that corporations and governments perpetrate on human beings and our planet every day. And none of those folks, virtually none of those folks, are serving a minute of time in prison. So if you want to say, hey, I support incarceration because if you're breaking the law, if you're harming people, you should be locked up, then you need to get behind the idea that we need to be incarcerating the people who are causing the greatest harm, right? The wealthy, uh, the rich, the, the billionaires, the people who are perpetrating crimes against humanity on, on planet Earth. Show me a prison. I defy you. Show me a prison where those folks are in the lockup, right? Um, so there's literally no comparison between the economic, the environmental, and the social harm that those folks perpetrate versus the people who are actually locked up. So, uh, which brings us to the voting matter. Yes, we know that um, felon disenfranchisement is, has been a, a project that has been on the books for, for decades where, yes, if you commit a felony, then you can't vote, sometimes forever, uh, and many times for a certain period of time. But another shout out, call out, call in to so many young folks who have mobilized around this issue successfully in states all across the nation to get those laws challenged and in many cases overturned. And to even go further and to say, well, it's not just that if you've served your time for any crime that you've allegedly committed, you should now be allowed to vote. But also, let's take a deeper look, going back to my earlier point, what kinds of crimes are deemed felonies 
in the first place. Again, why isn't polluting our air, our land, our water, our soil, our bodies deemed a crime, deemed a felony? Why are those folks allowed to stay out of prison and allowed to vote? Why are those folks actually pumping millions of dollars into our electoral systems so they can get the kinds of crony politicians elected or selected so they can continue to pass laws that benefit them. Let's ask about the social construction of crime in the first place that led to this. And let's also deal with the fact that felon disenfranchisement has historically been driven largely by racism and white supremacy and the thirst for the power that racial apartheid has delivered for a minority of folks in this country. So there's huge layers, many, many layers to, to that question. Uh, and it goes back to the work my mom did. She couldn't vote you know, at that time um, without having to go through all sorts of barriers because we didn't have the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act in 1962. That picture of her was during an era, again, of legal apartheid, particularly in the South. You, the hoops that you had to jump through just to be able to vote in the South. And then when you voted, you were generally voting for somebody who wasn't representing your interests. And we see this problem today with gerrymandering, with precision-like accuracy in districts all over the country, and thankfully people are challenging uh, that, that system in, in the courts. But the impulse is there. And that's, some would say that's natural because it's like, well, if I'm part of this political party, I wanna set up a system that works for me. I get that, uh, but that's not democratic, and young people have been successfully challenging that in so many ways, so glad to see that. Yeah, it's, it's terrific. So uh, our next speaker on Wednesday is Naomi Oreskes. is going to be talking about the injustice of the fact that the tobacco industry, for example, killed millions of people selling a poison, and none of those folks ever went to prison. None of the folks in the fossil fuel industry are going to prison. 100%. Um, 100%. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be skipping a few questions because I, we only have a certain amount of time, but here's another one. How can we stop the gold and silver mining in South America to stop poisoning and deforestation in the Amazon so it won't become a desert and impact the global environment? Yeah. So David, how do we do that? <laughs> what, what, what kind of mining? Uh, gold and silver, yeah. Yeah, so gold, gold and silver mining in, in Latin America, of course, deep, deep, long histories. We can go back to the conquistadores. Uh, these folks were hell-bent on ripping up the planet, um, certainly tearing up ecosystems and habitats and in indigenous communities in Latin America. So many um, folks in indigenous communities back 500 years ago were just like, what is up with these folks who came across the pond and are so thirsty, bloodthirsty, uh, for, for these minerals? We just don't get it. And they have this, this mythology of the seven cities of gold. Uh, these folks are, are driven and uh, unfortunately are, are laying waste to our ecosystems and our communities. Um, and so I, I guess to give a, an uncharacteristically short answer, I will say one really good way of, of fighting that struggle is to support the indigenous communities who have been harmed by, by that, that rapacious activity for the last half millennia because they have led the way uh, devising systems and, and visions and practices of sustainability of what we would call kin centricity of understanding that more than human, non-human animals and ecosystems and habitats are our family members that we will never win this battle if we just think of humans or just certain kinds of humans, people who look like me, for example, as part of our family, it's got to be everyone. Uh, and indigenous communities, particularly in that, that context, have, have led the way. I will say I'm a proud member of, of a group called Global Response that has fought companies like Newmont Mining Corporation, uh, which poisoned the air, land, and water in places like um, Cajamarca, Peru, and Indonesia, et cetera. And we follow the lead of indigenous communities, campesino communities, in those areas and how to fight those companies and how to kick them out. And we developed a mining guide, which you can download from the Cultural Survival Organizations called Cultural Survival, their website. I forget what it's called, Guide to Mining and Other Extractive Industries, which gives a step-by-step -step approach to how to kick out mining companies from your communities, how to prevent mining companies from coming into your communities, and how to get a better deal from those, those companies if you want them to stay in your communities. It's now been published in six different languages, uh, and if you, if you can't find it, email me, I'll send it to you. So those are some really good ways to deal with gold and silver mining in Latin America. 
Yeah. And, and if you're interested in this, there's a professor in the anthropology department, Jeff Hawley, who also has an appointment in environmental studies, has actually gone down there with those folks during the extraction to see what it was like. Anyhow, next question. Um, I really appreciate your optimistic attitude when discussing these topics, but how do you keep so positive while teaching about environmental issues and current events that share such bad news for the climate? You know, I think my personality, my genetic disposition, I don't know what it is, just, yeah, in the face of all of this shit we're dealing with, I'm just, just a chipper dude, you know? I, I wake up in the morning singing, snapping my fingers, so there's, there's clearly a chemical imbalance in my brain. I can't explain it any, any other way. Um, one other contributor is, is, again, I mentioned it earlier, the students on this campus, for some reason, I can't get y'all down. I try to depress you. I try to like be like the glass is super half half empty people and the water that's left in that glass is toxic it's poisonous and students like cool well, we're going to develop a water filtration device and we're going to sell that or give it out distribute it for free and we're going to challenge the system that produced that water and we're going to make sure there's more water and we're going to harvest rainwater I'm like damn I'm trying to get y'all down in the dumps and I can't do it so um, that's it that's it. It's the students and a chemical imbalance. So, yeah. uh, useful chemical imbalance. <laughs> uh, we actually had uh, last week's Sister True Dedication, a co-wrote Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet, about mindfulness practice and all and how that can help. But Yeah, um, yeah. well, and yes, and I, I do yoga, and I, I, I walk want... every day, and yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that helps. Yeah. That helps. And I listen to good music. So. <laughs> you do listen to good music. <laughs> yeah, so how do you feel about uh, the referendum on Ca um, California Senate Bill number 1137 if you happen to have the capacity to speak about it? I have no idea what that is. Please tell me and enlighten I, me. I don't know what it is either, actually. <laughs> I should. Yeah. If someone wants to do a follow-up question on there regarding what it is. Um, I mean, if you know the title of it, I might be more familiar. Um, okay, so I'm going to get to another okay. question. Uh, this one goes back to prisons. Uh, is there a way to incorporate environmental justice aims into rehabilitating people in prisons? Yeah, there's a wonderful project in the state of Washington called the Sustainability in Prisons Project, which is really focused on exactly that, on making sure that folks who are incarcerated, whether they're lifers or not, whether they're getting out at some point after they've served their time or they're going to be there forever, um, learning how to garden, learning how to compost, learning how to, to manage worms. And, I, and I, my, my favorite department on this campus is, of course, the Department of Public Worms. The students working in that are amazing. Um, learning, learning how to, to literally get in touch with, with cycles of life and understanding how to sequester carbon through composting, understanding how that um, leads to and contributes to regenerative agriculture, the kinds of agriculture that in addition to producing food, sequesters carbon and is a climate, part of the climate solution, and is a really invaluable skill for these incarcerated folks who again, they get out of prison and not only do they have skills for agriculture, gardening, landscaping, and they're getting jobs in that sector, but just as importantly, maybe more importantly, they're not mentally damaged in the ways that so many people who get incarcerated end up becoming, um, they are so much healthier um, psychologically because they've been doing this work. They've been connecting with nature, literally connecting with the soil, and there are studies after studies that show that when you are putting your feet and your bare hands in the soil, it has all sorts of health benefits, physical and mental health benefits. They are deriving those benefits. They are changed people when they get out. And so as much as I would love it to live in a world where there were no prisons or a hell of a lot fewer prisons. Uh, I have to say that the Sustainability in Prisons Project is, has this idea that as long as we do have prisons, let's make those conditions of confinement improved. Let's make sure that folks are getting real skills and we're improving their outlook on life and their health because that's not only good for them, it's good for the people around them, it's good for their family members, it's good for their neighbors, their communities. It's good for the economy, it's good for the environment. So, uh, Sustainability in Prisons Project is, I think, an exemplar of that. 
Yeah, terrific answer and project. Um, so I'm not sure what, what is, how this has been exactly, but uh, have you done any collaboration with the Feminist Studies Department? I don't know whether that's ES has or you have or faculty in Feminist Studies. I'm not sure what that would be. I'm, tr I'm trying to think. I, let's see, Feminist Studies. Off the, off the top of my head, I can't think of one, although I will say that in my work and my research and, and certainly my classes, uh, feminist scholarship, feminist theory, particularly eco-feminist scholarship, deeply informs uh, my work. I would say that attention to gender dynamics and, and the, the role of patriarchy and heteropatriarchy has been, uh, we've been Johnny come lately to, to that scene in the environmental justice literature and in the movement. It has almost been entirely based on this analysis of environmental sustainability as it intersects with class and race, etc. cetera. Uh, and so many of my feminist studies colleagues have pointed out, it's like, guess what, Holmes? Gender is a massive, massive problem uh, in terms of its intersection with the environment and climate. I'm, we're talking about incarceration. Well, one of the things, one of the problems I have with the ab so-called abolitionist movement today is they are so focused on the, the actual lockup, carceral systems, bricks and mortar uh, environments, the prisons, the jails, et cetera. I'm focused on that, but I'm an African-American, right? I'm a multiracial person who's actually focused on the history of abolition, which wasn't always about prisons. It was about slavery and enslavement. Here's a little dose of bad news if you didn't hear this before. In 2024, there's more human beings, there are more human beings on planet Earth who are enslaved than at any other time in human history. There's a whole host of reasons for that. But the majority of folks who are in that category are people who are actually in forced marriages. So it's not that people are in the lockup, in prisons, etc. It's not even forced labor. That's a huge part of it. But the biggest part of that, uh, that enslavement, is forced marriage. And that's controversial for some folks. I welcome that controversy. I don't think anybody should be forced into a lifelong uh, relationship. And so many scholars and policymakers and advocates have defined that as enslavement. Even taking that out of the picture, forced labor, indentured servitude, bonded labor, child labor, sex trafficking, etc., massive examples of human enslavement in 2024. Where is the abolitionist movement on that? I don't even, I couldn't even tell you. It's, it's ridiculous. But we have a lot of people who are focused on that because it turns out that some of the greatest contributors, and I forgot what your question is, but I'm just gonna go off for a minute. Some of the greatest contributors to environmental harm and climate harm on planet Earth are coming from industries and sectors where people are enslaved. The seafood industry, the timber industry, the gold mining industry, so thanks for that. Um, oh, there, there's a place in, in Peru, Madre de, de Dios, I think, uh, an, an example of where gold mining and enslavement and environmental harm come together. So again, if you don't care about human slavery, cool. Actually, not cool, but whatever. If you don't care about that, but you care, you're an environmentalist, well, you should care about slavery. Kevin Bales um, and Benjamin Sovacool have recently released a study that shows that I think if you added up all of the human beings who are enslaved on planet Earth, they would be the number two, number two contributor to global climate change emissions. This is extraordinary. We're not blaming those folks. We're blaming the system that is enslaving folks. So you hear something like that, and that is empirically based, that is actually scientifically documented, you can't unhear that. You can't unsee that. You can't say, let's solve the climate crisis, but enslavement, let's leave that alone, right? So abolition, prison, all of this stuff, it's connected to the climate crisis, and this is a wonderful opportunity. It's an invitation to, again, link various struggles, link and connect dots between this issue over there, that issue over there, like, boom, this is what intersectionality is about. That's a term people throw around with abandon. That's a part of why intersectionality makes sense. We can all work together toward the solution. Yes, we may be contributing to some of the problems, but again, that links us to the possibilities of making this world a better place. So. Um, how do I stay chipper doing all of that? Again, students and something going on in my brain, but yeah, I'm here. <laughs> uh, so first, thanks for that. Oh, so first to folks, um, Q&A is still open, number 14, week number eight, 
throw your questions in. We still have a few minutes. Um, and David, I was actually going to ask you to talk about intersectionality. We pretty much did because you were you were addressing it in there. We haven't had anyone actually address it specifically yet, but I think you did a pretty good job there. So, um, specific question here. I don't know if you if you can weigh in on this. Would a degree in microbiology help with the environment, like a job in the CDC or the FDA? Yes. I mean, seriously, uh, I can can't even count on, on my, my fingers and hands and toes how many students have come through UCSB who've gotten jobs at Environmental Defense Center, at Community Environmental Council, at uh, the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy, at the Fund for Santa Barbara, at the Foundation, the, the Santa Barbara Foundation. All of these organizations in this region were constantly hiring people who care about and who are committed to the environment. So yes, a degree in microbiology Hell yeah. Um, we are, you know, the Environmental Defense Center and Community Environmental Council work with, with experts who are focused on microbiology in the soils, the air, the land, the water, around all sorts of issues around agriculture, around endangered species, and are promoting policies and laws to make our environment in this region healthier. And we're really leading the nation. We've been, we've had, these organizations have inspired people in other parts of the country and other parts of the world to start new organizations that try to build on the work that we're doing. Um, we've created a Green New Deal framework uh, for Santa Barbara and Ventura County, and the science was important to that. So yes, there are tons of opportunities, absolutely. So just follow up on that sort of a technical question. Um, with ES, it's not possible to do a minor but there are a ton of people who do joint major with ES. Is that so? I mean, some were interested in microbiology, but they had an environmental interest. Is that the the approach people would go with? Yeah, that's certainly one, one approach. Um, we have, as I said, I forget what the percentage is, but if you talk to our undergraduate advisor in environmental studies, uh, Eric Zimmerman, he will he pull up the numbers. We have a huge percentage of people who are either environmental studies majors and minoring in another place or, or vice versa, but who are drawing on, again, yeah, whether it's microbiology or other biogeochemical sciences, um, and marrying that, integrating that with, with other fields, and just finding new ways to think about these, like, these grand challenges of our time. And, and we also have this thing called the outside concentration with, within environmental studies, and that, that's basically the minor where you take all these classes in another department or another sort of group of departments around a particular issue that, that, you, that really motivates you, that really inspires you, um, and allows you to go deeper into a particular area um, and get you over the hurdle for that degree. But yeah, but our undergraduate advisors are amazing. They can give you all that, that information. But yes, um, if you're interested in microbiology or any other, any other uh, discipline, you can bring that, that work to bear in environmental studies. And you can also, of course, do a senior thesis um, you can all, the, on any project you're interested in. And you could also be a part of the Environmental Leadership Incubator. Many of you may have heard of that, where we pair you up with a mentor who's often alum, an alum of UCSB, or a professional out in the field who can help guide you doing a research project that will have a high impact on somebody's community around the world on um, some really, really important environmental issue. You'll get credit for that. And there are ways and get, you know, we've got internships, you can get paid, we have all sorts of scholarships. Every year we hand out about $50,000 in scholarships for our students doing all sorts of work. Field studies in countries all around the planet, people are studying whales, people are in Costa Rica working on endangered species, uh, uh, restoration of beautiful turtle population in Costa Rica. This project, uh, Wagner Quiros, who graduated from Bren School, has been working in this organization called Bioma, takes students down who are helping local people harvest the eggs of these turtles up to a point so that people can get their protein, but we can make sure that this turtle species lasts and is thriving and is healthy, and they're collaborated with the city council in this town of Costa Rica. Uh, and it's just a beautiful collaboration, and students are learning the science they're bringing the arts and humanities to bear on this work, and they're getting an enormously important uh, and vibrant experience of traveling abroad and learning a new language and, and applying, applying knowledge. So all kinds of, of opportunities um, in environmental studies. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, and the person that David mentioned, um, Eric Zimmerman, who is the undergraduate advisor, 
was an under was a UCSB undergrad and has been the advisor there for I want to say decades, but for quite a long time. And, and ask Eric anything about anything that David just mentioned, and he's uh, on the ground the person really to address that. But actually, give another plug out. Um, so many of the people in here, one of the TAs for their class is Meet, and Meet is working with you, bringing a database online. It has to do with prison. So just to Get the plug for Meet. What's that about? Yeah, Meet is doing some amazing work using all sorts of programs. I think, you know, GIS, I think he's using R, some, some computer language, some computer programming. Yeah, he's, he's, he's brilliant. And yeah, he's looking at, he's creating uh, a, a database, data set, and drawing on other, other sets to create a visual tool for, for mapping the, the intersection between a whole host of, of environmental and climate hazards and, and our prison systems and our jails in California. And he's doing it in collaboration with organizations who are focused on environmental justice and in particular, immigrant justice. So, so he's also looking at Im immigrant prisons, immigrant detention centers. He could explain it far better than, than I ever could. But, uh, but yeah, our first meeting, he's like, David, here's this map I've created and it just visually just laid out where the people are, where the prisons are, where the hazards are, and it just gives you tools, and people have used these tools to, to mobilize environmental justice campaigns. One of which, just in 2019, I, my students and I played a small role, small part, in this campaign that prevented the construction of what would have been the most expensive federal penitentiary in US history in Letcher County, Kentucky. So folks in Kentucky who wanted jobs, who wanted economic development were like, I think we can do better than just bringing a prison in. Can we think of a better way of creating jobs and creating economic development and, and, and a, an economy that's healthy than just locking people up? We've already had the coal mining industry that laid waste to our community. Let's do better than that. Speaking of coal mining, that prison was intended to be located smack dab on a site where a mountain used to exist. There's no longer a mountain there because the coal industry blew up the freaking mountain in what is called mountain top removal. Um, and you don't, need a lot of, you don't need a lot of people to do that. Stick a dynamite in there and blow it up. It's like Yosemite Sam. I mean, just blow this mountain up and uh, get to the coal seams, lays waste to the ecosystem. So they wanted to put a prison on top of that. Well, Letcher Governance Project, a grassroots group of folks in Kentucky, connected up with the Campaign to Fight Toxic Prisons, an organization that I work with, and, and a whole host of people who are currently incarcerated who wrote letters to the Federal Bureau of Imprisons and said, we could at any moment be moved to that prison, because that's how it works, you can be moved around, but that prison is toxic, there's all sorts of environmental hazards there, the water is unhealthy, and they're endangered species, the Indiana bat, the gray bat, who are suffering from white nose syndrome. This is a horrible idea. Can't we come up with better, better ways of dealing with our social and economic and environmental problems? Well, in July of 2019, the Federal Bureau of Prisons withdrew that project. They said, yo, you won. Your comments on and your analysis of the environmental impact report, we agree. It was going to be hazardous for endangered species. It was going to be hazardous for the environment, bad for people. We will not build this prison. This was a major victory, and I, I'm just pleased to be a, a part of these networks. And again, it was students who really played a pivotal role in that. So, uh, I can't think of a better, more positive sort of student, faculty, activist note on which to end. So everyone, would you thank David Pello for coming today? Okay, and um, I'm going to do the last eye clicker now, and then um, we'll see you on Wednesday for Naomi Oreskes. Okay, thanks so much, everyone.